Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Today we're going to look at an interesting class of prime numbers known as Cuban prime numbers and also explore their connection with certain figurate numbers. So Cuban primes are simply primes that are of the form the difference between two consecutive cubes. So in other words, we have a natural number n and we look at n plus 1 cubed minus n cubed. But with some fairly standard symbolic manipulation, that will simplify to 3n squared plus 3n plus 1. So what we're really looking at is primes of the form 3n squared plus 3n plus 1. And there's like really nice results for primes of linear forms. So like 4n plus 3, 5n plus 1, and so on and so forth. But primes of quadratic or higher order form, really there's no proof that there are infinitely many such primes. So let's maybe look at the first couple Cuban primes. So I'm going to introduce some notation to start with. So let's set f of n equal to 3n squared plus 3n plus 1. Okay, and now let's evaluate this at some numbers. So let's notice f evaluated at 1 is 7. That's most definitely a prime number. So that's good. f evaluated at 2, you can work that out. That's 19. That's also a prime number. So we get a prime number out of that as well. f evaluated at 3 is equal to 37, and f evaluated at 4 is equal to 61. And both of these are prime as well. But if we look at f evaluated at 5, we get the number 91, which is not prime. That's 7 times 13. So we don't always get a prime number. But I think we probably knew that we wouldn't always get a prime number given that there is no function that generates primes like this. But if we go back to f evaluated at 6, we get another prime number and that will be 127. Now a typical question to ask when we're looking at types of prime numbers would be the largest known prime number of this type. So in this case, the largest known Cuban prime. And the largest known Cuban prime looks like this. So it's f evaluated at the following number. So we have one and then one, two, three, four, five zeros. And then we have eight, four, five, but that's not all. Then we have that to the 4096th power. So this is a really large number. And so I'll write the first couple of digits and the last couple of digits. So it starts with 312, 3215, I should say. And then it ends with 343, three, and then 751. And you might say, well, how many digits are in the middle there? Well, there's an astronomically large number of digits in the middle. There are 65,527 digits that we've left off here. And in fact, what's interesting about this number is that Mathematica can really easily calculate it very quickly, like in less than a second, but has a hard time checking if it's prime. In fact, I didn't let it run long enough to see if it could decide whether or not this number was prime. And that's all we're really gonna say about these so-called Cuban primes. And now we're gonna move on to something else that's related to this number 3n squared plus 3n plus 1, and those are the centered hexagonal numbers. Today's video is about primes, which is convenient because it's brought to you by a prime website, Skillshare. If you haven't heard by now, Skillshare is the online learning community that's helped millions to take the next step in their creative journeys. They have tons of classes on things like productivity, fine art, marketing, and graphic design, ranging in difficulty for anyone from beginners to experts. Most of the classes offered are under 60 minutes, and every class is always 100% ad-free. I recently found Rich Armstrong's class on animation and procreate. This is where I learned to make the animations you see in today's video. Since all Skillshare classes are on demand, it is easy to fit them into my busy schedule. 
They're always adding new classes, so there's never a lack of skills to be shared. Now that you know the why and the who, let me tell you the where, how, and when. Where? In the description. There's a link. How? Click it to sign up for Skillshare. When? Today. And thanks one more time to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. So the first centered hex hexagonal number is the number one, and that's because we think of like this single dot as a hexagon. And then we'll build a hexagon around this, keeping this at the center for the second hexagonal number. So we'll add two dots at the top, two dots at the bottom, and then a dot on either side for those vertices. And then if we connect them, we can see a hexagon forming. So there's our hexagon. And then you can just keep going. And what you'll see is after the first centered hexagonal number of one, the second one is seven, as we see here. The third one is 19. The fourth one is 37. The fifth one is 61. The sixth one is 91. And the seventh one is 127. And you could just keep drawing pictures and keep getting new centered hexagonal numbers. But what we'd like to do is work towards some sort of general formula. So we need to look for a pattern. So with our notation that h of n is our nth centered hexagonal number, we'll think about how to build the n plus first centered hexagonal number. And so as you notice, we can add n plus one new dots to each edge. And there are six edges because it's a hexagon. But then we've over counted the dots at every vertex. So we've counted each of those twice. So that means we need to subtract six so that we do not over count. And that brings us to the nice recursion, which is h of n plus 1 equals h of n plus 6 times n, which we can use to build a generating function for these numbers. So we just motivated the following recursion for our centered hexagonal numbers. So h n plus 1 is equal to h n plus 6 n. Now we'll use that along with generating functions in order to derive our closed form of 3 n squared plus 3 n plus 1. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's start by defining h of x to be equal to the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of h of n times x to the n. So in other words, the generating function. But now let's maybe apply our recursion. We probably need to do some sort of re-indexing first. We can rewrite this as the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of h n plus one times x to the n plus one. Let's notice that we can do that without changing the lower bound because indeed the zeroth centered hexagonal number is zero. So we don't even really need that. We can start this at one. Okay, now we need to take our re-indexed sum and pull out the first term because we can't apply the recursion to our first term. Notice this applies for n bigger than or equal to one, but our first term, or maybe I should say our zeroth term is not that. Okay, so taking out the zeroth term gives us h of one times x to the one, so in other words, x. And then we'll have the sum as n goes from one to infinity of h of n plus one times x to the n plus one. But I might as well rewrite that a little bit. I'll take one of these powers of x and factor it out. And then I'll apply my recursion to h n plus one, giving me h of n plus six n. And then we have x to the n. So something like that. And now let's rewrite this a little bit. I'll have x plus x times the sum as n goes from one up to infinity of h of n x to the n plus six x times the sum as n goes from one up to infinity of n times x to the n. So now I'll start by noticing that this term which I'm boxing in green is exactly my original generating function which I called h of x. Then uh, this second sum can actually be started at n equals zero because the zeroth term is just equal to zero so that doesn't add anything. Okay, and then we'll take this sum here and, and recognize it as the derivative of something. But in order to do that safely, I think we should change this n to an n minus one by factoring another power of x out. 
And here we're gonna use the fact that the derivative with respect to x of x to the n equals n times x to the n minus one. So that means we're summing over all of these derivatives of x. Okay, so let's rewrite this a little bit. We have x plus x times h of x, and then we'll have plus six x squared, and then the derivative with respect to x of, the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of x to the n. Great, where I took my derivative outside of the sum because these generating functions are just a combinatorial tool. We don't really need to worry about convergence. Now we can see that this is a geometric series. We could rewrite this as one over one minus x. And if we take its derivative, we get one over one minus x quantity squared. So that's nice. So that leaves us with x plus x times h of x plus x 6x squared over one minus x quantity squared when all is said and done. But let's maybe bring my h of x down. Now I have this nice functional equation for my generating function. So I can start to solve that. Maybe note that we have one minus x times h of x equals x plus 6x squared over one minus x quantity squared, so something like that. Now we'll divide by one minus x and we'll get the following expression. And I'm gonna like skip a couple steps. This is after putting some things together with a common denominator, but we end up with something like this. So it'll be x cubed plus four x squared plus x over one minus x quantity cubed. So again, that's after putting some stuff together. Okay, so now let's start from there and then work towards our closed formula. So this is where we left ourselves off with our generating function. Then you'd probably like to decompose it with partial fractions, and I haven't worked that out, but this is the result. You get minus one plus seven over one minus x minus 12 over one minus x squared plus six over one minus x cubed. But what we'd really like to do is write each of those as derivatives of a geometric series. So let's do that. So we've got minus one, which is by itself, and then plus seven times the plain old geometric series. So that's the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of x to the n. And then we'll have minus 12. And then this one over one minus x squared is the derivative of one over one minus x. So that'll be the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of n times x to the n minus one. Because again, we've taken the derivative to go from one over one minus x to one over one minus x quantity squared. And then this next one is the second derivative, but because the derivative of the one over one minus x squared will give us a two, we'll actually just have plus three times the second derivative. So this will be the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of n times n minus one times x to the n minus two. So we're left with something that looks like that. And furthermore, we can start this sum at the number two because the first two terms of this were zero and the first term of that were zero. And then from there, we'll want to re-index. So we'll want to re-index so everything looks like x to the n. So that means in this first sum, we'll replace all of the n's with n plus ones. And in this second sum, we'll replace all of the n's with n plus twos. That'll have the effect of both of these starting at zero as well, so that's pretty nice. So that'll give us negative one plus seven times the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of x to the n, that stays the same, minus 12, and now we'll have the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of n plus one times x to the n, and then plus three, we'll have the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of n plus one times n plus two times x to the n. So something like that. And now it's just a matter of putting this all together. So let's notice that these two terms will multiply out to n squared plus three n plus two. And then we can look carefully at the constant term. So we've got a seven for the constant term here, a negative one for the constant term here. 
that turns into a six. We have a negative 12 for the constant term here, that turns into a negative six after combining with this six. And then we have a positive six for the constant term here. So that means all of the constant terms cancel out meaning that we can erase this minus one and then start all of these at one instead of zero. So that's pretty good. And then we can just start putting things together. So let's put this all into one sum. We'll have the sum as n goes from one to infinity right now. Our highest power of n will be n squared. That's attached to a three. So we have three n squared. Okay, so now let's look at the n term. We have a minus 12 n from here, and then we'll have a plus nine n from here. That'll give us a minus three n. And then for the constant term, we have a seven minus 12, which is negative five, and then plus six, so that'll be plus one. And then we'll have x to the n. But now let's recall that this was originally the generating function for the center hexagonal numbers. So this means this should be the same as the sum as n goes from one to infinity of h of n times x to the n. And now comparing the coefficients of x to the n from both sides, we get our desired result. And you might say, well, this almost looks like what we have up here. It's just off by a sign. But that sign can be achieved by replacing n with n minus 1 here meaning that these are shifted versions of the same formula. So I've done a couple of videos on types of primes. In fact, one I particularly like was on something called an Euler prime. That should be on the screen right now if you'd like to check it out. And that's a good place to stop.